Welcome to the Balanced Collective, where we love to go deep, talk big, and get real. I'm your host, Danielle Boyd, and every episode is going to bring a new concept or guest to talk all about things wellness, balance, and alignment. Our purpose here is to bridge the concepts of science and spirit to bring wellness and ease into the lives of our listeners while not taking life too seriously. We like to get down and deep into our shadow while keeping things raw, fun, and real. Thank you so much for listening. Let's get to it. Woohoo! Another episode. Welcome, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in and listening. I'm really, really excited about this conversation that I'm going to share with you today. Uh, Lacey Forsyth is the owner and founder of Bump Physio and Co., which is a physiotherapy clinic that specializes in women's health, pelvic health, and perinatal health. And what Lacey has done with her space is not only create an incredibly safe and beautiful space for her clients, but her message and her just all everything she offers has been born out of the own work that she has done internally with herself. And I, I just, I think it's just such a beautiful story that, you know, her journey has led her to helping other people who, who need the same kind of help. And she's really taken a very detail oriented approach to everything. She is really taken into account what she would have liked during her journey or what did make a huge difference during her journey. And this this look at you know how to build her clinic through the lens of a patient is a beautiful beautiful thing that she has brought to what she has built Lacey and I went to physio school together. We started back in 2012, which seems like so long ago. Oh my goodness, which means I've known Lacey for quite a long time and it's been an absolute honor and such a beautiful process to just watch Lacey's vision unfold and to see that the work that she's doing is really, really helping many, many people. And so I I just could not be more proud of her and I'm so excited to share this episode with you. Um, but before we do, I will actually let her sons introduce her. So without further ado, my conversation with Lacey Forsyth of Bump Physio and Co. Hi, my mom uh, works for Bump Physio & Co and she's the owner. Nice! What does she do uh, there? She, she helps on pregnancy as well as other stuff. Hi Lacey. Hi Danielle. How's it going? Good, how are you? <laughs> Thanks for having me to your beautiful home. I love being out here with like greenery and Coquitlam. It's just really nice. Oh, thanks for coming all this way to see me. On a rainy Friday afternoon, this is like nothing better than just sinking into a nice cozy couch and hanging out. Yeah, no, it's awesome. <laughs> Before we dive into some of the work that you're doing, which is really special and really cool, I would love to chat a little bit about your life outside of your work. Who is Lacey outside of the work she's doing? Outside of being a, a physio, um, I'm a mom to two boys who are almost 9 and 11, um, pretty athletic little kids who definitely keep hubby and I busy. Um, Pretty much, I go to work and I'm a mom. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty much about it. Those are very occupying things to do. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. I remember, so like we went to physio school together, and I remember when you started physio school, your boys were, you said two and three. Yeah. It's just wild to me that they're, you said almost nine and 11 now? Yeah, Gabe turns nine this Christmas, and Nolan will be 11 in February. Holy smokes. Yeah. We've known each other a long time. I know, right? <laughs> it's like a long time. And it's so neat to see just like how everyone has grown from school and just like the things they're doing because there's some people from our class, including yourself, who are doing some really awesome things. And so that's a great segue into the work you're doing. You're the owner of Bump Physio Co. What is Bump Physio Co.? Um, so Bump Physio Co. is a prenatal, postpartum, and pelvic floor specialty clinic in the heart of Port Moody, BC. Um, we like treating women um, through all stages of life. Um, however, our primary focus is prenatal postpartum care. Um, we have a couple of therapists on staff that provide clinical Pilates um, for prenatal postpartum as well as uh, exercise rehab and personal training. So for us, we're a very active approach um, to pre and postnatal health. Very cool. Yeah. I love that there's so many different modalities that are integrated in this model because it's not just pelvic work. It's not just exercise. It's not just active rehab or Pilates. It's like 
let's do all the things and combine them in the perfect way that's unique to each client. Yeah, it's great to have a multidisciplinary team that really works together um, to be able to collaborate on cases and mm. have open dialogues with different disciplines has been really, really beneficial to the clients and to ourselves and our own learning. And it just makes the client feel so much more like validated and heard and understood when you know you're coming up with more of a custom program for them and not just like the run of the mill like here's what you got to do like xyz yeah. it's more customized that way and the clients just have so much more better like better outcomes when it is customized in that way yeah and it also increases adherence to yeah. their programs because most of the clients we do see are moms and it's really mm -hmm. hard for them to get to their homework sometimes we try and limit it the amount that they get like yeah. my rule is 10 minutes um but sometimes when they're becoming stronger and they're getting to a higher level they want bigger programs so to be able to work one-on-one -on -one with someone who specializes in that area of fitness has been really helpful because they know that they have this appointment they come to the appointment and then that way their self-care is done for that day yeah. as opposed to trying to balance everything at home and squish it in um, sometimes it's not as their adherence isn't quite as high. Yeah, yeah, I hear that. Yeah. I know my, my whole rule when I give exercises is the more I give, the less people do. So I start with like two exercises. Yep. Usually it's a release and an activation. And then let's see where you're at next week or in two weeks when we touch base again. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, what made you want to go into, you know, perinatal and like women's health? That's a good question. Um, so it all kind of started in physio school. I was the only mom in the program mm -hmm. at the time, and I realized like doing assessments on classmates and chatting with friends that my body was definitely very different after having kids. Everyone was fascinated with my core um, <laughs> because I was the only one with issues or a structural defect in my core in the class. So for me, there was always a lot of things kind of going on, mm -hmm. um, which kind of piqued my interest. And then being a mom myself, um, yeah. just kind of going through the process and knowing how our bodies change and how the medical system is structured. Um, coming out of physio school, I had a few kind of signs along the way that I kind of ignored. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I had a physio that in my first job and there was a private room in the clinic and she said to me, she's like, I really think I really think you should get into women's health. And I said to her, I said, that's not really my jam. Like, I really don't want to treat vaginas all day. And she's like, I actually think you'd be really good at it. And I was like, I oh, know. And then I ran into somebody else, was one of my midwives who had delivered my kids. And she's like, have you ever thought about going into public floor? And I was like, no, like, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Exactly. I'm like, Why does everybody want me to go into women's health? I'm like, and my mind just wasn't there at that point. Um, and then I kind of was like waiting because I was like, well, there should be a women's health clinic out here because I need to go see a fair like physio and I don't know who to go see. So mm -hmm. I waited and I waited and I waited and finally I just got fed up and was like, fine, if nobody's going to open this clinic, I am. <laughs> like, so, fine, universe, I'll take your signs. <laughs> exactly. That was exactly it. And I think it took a lot of um, personal work and introspection as to why I had so many walls and barriers put up in terms of mm. getting into pelvic floor. Um some of the stuff I never really shared with colleagues in class is I do have two different types of prolapse and um, I was incontinent after having mm, kids. Okay. So it was just more like my own disconnect from my own pelvic floor. I think that was one of the bigger barriers in terms of avoiding going into this area. That's, that's so the case. Like when yeah. we don't want to look at our own stuff, right? Like, yeah. and it's just, you know, whether that's physical or emotional or whatever it is yeah. until we deal with our own stuff, we can't help others with it so yeah. obviously that was like a huge key to unlocking these barriers that so. was a big barrier yeah so postpartum for me looked a lot like um i was incontinent for four years post birth i have a bladder prolapse a rectal prolapse and i had painful intercourse with my husband for like three years wow. and i just thought that this was normal after having kids as many women do as yeah. many women do and for me it was like having to work through like the psychological and the emotional and the physical was was I just wasn't there I wasn't ready yeah. and sometimes it's just easier to ignore it because we were busy with the kids as opposed to actually like diving into the reasons why some of these issues were manifesting so I'm always usually last on my priority list and having to <laughs> focus on myself to change some of those things yeah um it took a lot of work but I figured that going through my own process and changing the way that I live yeah. I knew that it empowered me to be able to help others wow what did that work look like for you? Um, I went and saw a counselor yeah. to deal with like the emotional aspect of it because once your body's experienced pain in what's supposed to be an intimate and pleasurable experience, 
over time it learns that when that experience is about to happen, you create this like global tension and you start bracing Completely, and yeah. you just, it kind of reinforces that. So there's a sympathetic fight or flight response to it almost. Exactly. That's exactly what happens. Wow. So I had to come to terms with a few things from my past, um, working with a counselor and a marriage counselor and just working through that piece. Um, wow. and then just learning about the pelvic floor. So actually being comfortable with my own pelvic floor, understanding what it is, understanding what it does, understanding that touch can be good, touch can be bad, and like learning about my own body mm -hmm. um, was kind of how it started. And then I decided to take a course down in the States, um, the obstetric certification. Mm -hmm. um, and after the first class, because I wasn't still sure if I wanted to get into pelvic floor, <laughs> and so I took the course and I, I met a lot of the other therapists on there and they were already pelvic trained and they go, you're gonna need to do your pelvic. And I came back and I still wasn't convinced. And then I did my level two for OB. And then I was like, shoot, okay, yeah, yeah, no, I do need to do my pelvic because I still felt like a piece was missing. Yeah. So I went through the training and yeah, here we are. Amazing. I love that the parallel with the story is you doing your own inner healing work and physical healing work and all the healing work. And what that has manifested in is you creating this beautiful, safe environment that is Bump Physio and Co. And it's a beautiful, safe clinic for women that can now do their own healing. And, and your healing has created like healing for many. It's yes. It's pretty great. So cool. Yeah. Man, I'm like, I just, I love this story. I actually I hadn't heard it and, yeah. you know, outside of work and I love it. It's so cool. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. What now do you see like with the clinic obviously came to fruition? When did the clinic open? May 1st, 2019. Well, I started working from home right, yeah. um, last March, so March 2018. I worked from home. I opened up a home-based business. Yeah. Um, after launching Bump, I was fully booked in three weeks <laughs> and realized going, oh, okay, I might need some help. Um, so after about six months of being run off my feet at home, I started to look at commercial space um, to help grow. Um, and to help serve more women because clearly there was a need that wasn't yeah. being met and there still isn't but and, and yeah. it's important to be able to separate your work from your home as well too I believe and so having the commercial space obviously was a huge it it was however I do miss doing loads of laundry on my lunch break because then it was done <laughs> <laughs> yeah multitasking right that's what great. we do as women right yeah and I didn't have to pack my own lunch I could just come upstairs <laughs> So then you found the space, you, yeah. you, you built the space, you had to renovate it. You had to, yeah, it was brand, new. brand yeah. new space and a brand new building in Port Moody. Yeah. What did that process look like? So were you renovating and working on the space while you were still working at home at the same time and like juggling being a mom and, and wife and yeah. <laughs> so that process was crazy. Um, I was still working full time from home. I was project managing a construction build and then I was dealing with my kids. Um, luckily enough, because I am an entrepreneur, I can create my own schedule that works for me. So some weeks I worked more, some weeks I worked less. Um, I ebbed and flowed. Sometimes I worked seven days a week in order to see my caseload. Um, but pretty much my work day started about 6.30 in the morning and ended at midnight. Oh, um, my goodness. For five and a half months. And doing laundry on your lunch break. And... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It was just getting it done. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. so then the clinic space opened and you transitioned from home to clinic-based. And you've hired now. How many people are working at the clinic? Nine. Oh, my gosh. myself. Yeah. So wow. we've grown from a team of one to a team of nine. Um, in six months, which is pretty incredible. Um, I was my biggest worry about opening the practice was finding other practitioners because everybody knows in the physio world, pelvic floor physios are very hard to find. Yes. Um, so I was so scared because my just the overhead costs of opening a business are quite high and in, in a new building and in a new space. Yeah. Um, so I just crossed my fingers and hoped for the best and. What's been really actually interesting is I've attracted physios who trained five or six years ago, but never found the space where they felt safe enough to treat. Wow. So I, that is like really cool to me and an honor because if you create an environment that's very welcoming and inviting, mm -hmm. um, you'll attract the kind of talent that you're looking for. Because I won't just hire a new pelvic physio. I'm actually quite picky yeah. about who I share my space with because mm -hmm. I need the clients who are being referred to me and are trusting those referrals to get a similar experience with somebody else as they do with me. Yes. Um, they need to 
to feel welcome. There's a certain energy that has to come with that. There's a certain expectation that yeah. you, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. And having been through the process yourself, you know what you liked and what you would have liked had that existed, I'm sure. Yes. So you've been able to create this space based on what your ideal treatment scenario would have been, you know, maybe through your process and your journey. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's actually really funny because when we built the clinic, um, everyone's like, how did you design the clinic? Because I did all the layout and design. I did all the finishings. I picked all the materials, everything like that. And I really just thought to myself, like, what kind of space do I feel comfortable in? Mm -hmm. What kind of space do I feel safe in? Like, my clients have been coming to my home, and they have enjoyed their experiences in my home with their treatment because they felt it was a safe space. Yeah. So when I was building the clinic, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to make it like my house. Perfect. So I don't know if you've noticed because you've seen the clinic. Yes, I have. The doors in the hallway are the doors in the clinic. The sliding ones. The wood sliding ones. The wood sliding one is in the clinic. Oh. The, the um, farmhouse doors. Yeah. They're the same as in my home. Oh my gosh. That that's so, I didn't even notice that. That's so cool. So I've created a little mini home yeah. there for women to come to. And like what you talk about, like with safe space, if someone doesn't feel safe, they're not going to tell their story and they're not going to let you even access them neurologically. Like they're, nope. you know, like you have to create that safe environment. And so, and not only safe for the client, but safe for the practitioner too. Like the yeah. practitioner has to feel comfortable and safe. And you know, like there has to be that, that vibe and that energy of safety and home to the to the whole environment that you're yeah. treating in that's yeah. huge so when women come in for a pelvic floor assessment and when they're being vulnerable and sharing their stories they need to feel like the person they're sharing those experiences that they've probably never talked to even their partner about mm -hmm. that they're being heard and they're being understood Completely. and that their needs are being met in that mm -hmm. space and it's it's a very difficult conversation for a lot of people to have. Yeah. So to create a physically welcoming environment um, of warm paint tones and soft mm -hmm. textures really actually enhances their experience, but it calms them down. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And like the foresight on your part for that is amazing. We talked a little bit before we started recording about some of the other touches that you've put into the clinic. What are some of the other like homey, comfortable, safe things that you've included in that that building? Um, for me, the biggest thing actually was picking the right paint color. Yeah. Um, I love white and I love that like Scandinavian modern feel, yeah. um, but a lot of those spaces can feel cold yeah. because of the underlying tones of the paint. Right. So I deliberately picked a nice warm white. Um, yeah. It's a soft creamy white. I picked a vibrant, like warmer floor tone. Yeah. Um, I have flannel blankets in each treatment room yes. for women because sometimes when you're having um, a pelvic exam done, you're if you're uncomfortable, you're nervous, you can get cold, yeah. um, and then your muscles start to tremor. So we have blankets to kind of keep people a little bit calmer. Right. All the chairs in the treatment spaces are velvet, and they're big and like high back chairs, so you kind of sink into them. So cozy. So you can curl up and, and share your story. So. I feel like I want to just like sit in one of those chairs and like have a glass of wine and like. <laughs> Especially that green one. It's my favorite. <laughs> Well, let's do it. Well, next time we record a podcast, we'll go sit in those chairs. <laughs> That's, <perfect. laughs> That's really cool. I love that. And what does like an, an, an initial assessment look like typically with you guys? Obviously, there's an element of like chatting and connection and building that relationship yeah. before, you know, you start going deeper physically. <laughs> yeah. So when um, clients come in for an initial assessment, um, the assessment actually starts before they get to the clinic. Mm -hmm. So when they call or book online, we always send them um, a two page information sheet as to what to expect at their right. visit. Because even though people are coming to us for a pelvic floor visit, they sometimes are still surprised that there's an internal exam component to right. it if they consent. So we always wanna make sure that that experience starts before they get there mm -hmm. so that they're more mentally and physically prepared for that right. appointment. Um, when someone comes into my space, I initially try and read them pretty quickly in terms of their level of comfort, mm -hmm. of openness. Um, we start just by small talk. How are you doing today? How's your weekend? Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Just kind of break the ice a little bit, yeah. getting to know them. Yeah. Um, and then we start with what in physio world we call subjective history. So why are they here? Like what is going on that brought them to see, to see me or any of the other practitioners in the mm -hmm. clinic? Um, and sometimes that's our assessment because 
our conversations aren't always easy. There's tears. There's a lot of sharing on both parts. Um, so if I just spend that first assessment building rapport with the client, um, then that's what we do. Yeah. However, most people are, we can usually get through that and then we do an, an exam. Um, I always give clients the option of starting with an external exam so they get to know me better right. um, as opposed to starting with the internal if it's more of a complex case. Yeah. Um, sometimes people are just, oh no, I've seen another pelvic floor physio before. I didn't really connect with them. This is why we're, I'm just trying something else. And, and that's fair because I know I'm not everybody's cup of tea too. So for us, it really is an individual yeah. case by case basis. Sometimes it's talking, sometimes it's a external hip exam or a low back exam, and then you give them exercises. Sometimes it's an internal pelvic. Um, so it really does depend. Right. Yeah. It's really interesting the like the subjective part and, and the rapport building. I mean, you are talking about a very sensitive topic for many people mm-hmm. and the tears and the emotions that come up, that's something that I've always kind of thought that we were not as exposed to or as well prepared for in our training. Yeah. How do you handle, I mean, like there's a lot of emotion and a lot of, you know, like you're almost kind of acting as a counselor in this area. And I mean, yeah. maybe they exist, but I don't, you know, like there's not as many like pelvic floor counselors or like. I'm sure there's sexual health counselors and stuff that you refer to when it's necessary, but what do you find has prepared you or like what tools do you use that help in that kind of counseling aspect? Um, I listen a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, I empathize. Mm -hmm. If a client is being vulnerable with me, I'm vulnerable with them Mm -hmm. um, to build that connection. So if they're sharing a story and if I feel that they need to be validated in what they're saying. I will share a vulnerable story of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that I build deeper, deep, deeper connections with my clients, mm-hmm. um, and I think it's because I'm vulnerable with them. Yeah. Um, I refer a lot out yeah. to counselors. I have a counselor here in Poco that I send a lot of my clients to, especially my clients who have had trauma. Um, I do refer to sexual health specialists and sexual health psychologists Mm -hmm. um, also in the area. Um, So I always treat from a very multidisciplinary approach because treating the physical aspect is one thing, but the research that's been done in pelvic health or the limited research that's been done in pelvic Mm -hmm. health shows that there is a very strong psychological contribution to pelvic floor uh, function, health, and wellness. That makes perfect sense. I mean... yeah. I've actually told a client they're not ready for that physical because they haven't dealt with the emotional. Um, So just learning how to set boundaries and how to create a treatment plan um, by listening to what my clients are saying and hearing what Mm -hmm. they need. Yeah. That's amazing. I like it's, I mean, I wouldn't call it rare, but I, I don't see it as much as I would like to in the physio world, you know, people who have that awareness and that, empathy and that like listening is an art and it's a skill and if you cannot listen to a client and you know validate them and make them feel heard it doesn't matter what training you've done it doesn't matter how skilled you are that client is not going to be open to receiving their treatment if you cannot hear them yeah it's huge 100 percent. and especially in this realm yeah like, especially in such a sensitive and intimate conversation that you're having yeah so we typically always are err on the side of caution and we always assume that we treat from a trauma-informed lens so Mm -hmm. for us what that means is is always assume that someone and it doesn't have to be physical trauma or sexual trauma that someone has experienced trauma in their life and you need to approach them from where they're at you need to meet them where they are at not where you're at because sometimes it's an just it just doesn't add up so Mm -hmm. for us to assume that someone needs a little bit of extra TLC Mm -hmm. is always a better approach as opposed to assuming that everything's peachy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and assuming everything is peachy, that's kind of like the norm right now. And I think your story in, you know, like being fully booked within three weeks is just a testament to the fact that this is a huge problem that is under, underexposed. Like there's so much taboo around it and there's so many, so much shame for people around it. And, you know, like, all of a sudden there's a safe space and so people are, are booking and, and, and you know coming to see you. And to me that just tells me that there's not enough attention and not enough, you know, openness and conversation about these topics. Like this is yeah. you know, sexual health, public health, perinatal, you know, women's health in general is very, very understated, I guess is the word. Like it's it's something that 
we should all have better exposure and conversation and less shame around. Absolutely, 100%. That's, yes. I'd like, thank you for doing this and having these conversations and helping these women and exposing this because what you're doing is you're making a huge impact on the community. And Thanks. that's really cool. Thank you. Um, so what are some of the things, I mean, like on that note, people and uh, women in, in, in particular after having a baby, you know, Oh, it's just normal that when I jump on a trampoline, I pee or like, it's just normal that like I have painful intercourse after a baby, you know, like what are some of the big things that you're seeing in the clinic that, you know, I'm, like, I'm assuming a lot of people are coming in, oh, it's totally normal. I had a baby and it's totally normal for this and X, Y, Z to happen. But what are some of the biggest things that you're seeing walking through your door right now? So all the mom memes out there, um, <laughs> like the classics. So I leak. Um, when I cough, sneeze, run, jump, um, I can't play with my kids because my back hurts. Um, I can't have sex with my husband or partner um, mm -hmm. because it's too painful. Mm -hmm. um, tailbone pain mm -hmm. is a big one. Um, and abdominal, like, uh, separations and diastasis. But those are all totally normal after pregnancy, right? Right, yeah, <laughs> super normal things. Um, so those are kind of the big ones that we get. Um, what was really cool, and this was like, I don't know if it was a big win, but I think it's a big win for women's health. What, there was, I had a client a couple of, about a month ago, mm -hmm. um, and she was pregnant, and her mom told her to go see a pelvic floor physio wow. while she was pregnant because she didn't want her to end up like her. Wow. I was like, what? Huge. That was huge. I'm like, it's working. Like, the conversations are working. Yes. And I think the biggest piece is for women to feel comfortable sharing their stories with everybody else. Yeah. Like, to talk to their friends. And if you've seen a pelvic floor physio, send everybody. Yeah. Because anyone, like, everyone's like, oh, well, who should I refer to you? And I was like, anyone with a pelvis <laughs> should at any point see someone with a pelvic floor, like, should see a pelvic floor trained physio. Yeah. Because we are the only ones that can assess 11 muscles on the inside of the pelvis yeah. that implicate or have... Um, mm -hmm that um, affect your low back and hips and glutes and all those mm -hmm. types of things. So anyone with hip pain, anyone with back pain, things like that are all a part of pelvic floor health. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. Sports, high level athletes, mm -hmm. um, a lot of incontinence issues with high level athletes. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so wow. it's just a big, it's, it's a pretty broad spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you ever worked with men or, or those who identify as masculine, or is it just women, like, or those identify as women only? On special requests, I'll treat a few males. Yeah. Um, there is a very different approach to pelvic floor physio in males. Um, I like the sports pelvic floor mm -hmm. males more, the low back pain, the hip pain, because yeah. um, I, I know I can make a difference there, but... For me, um, even though I did my training in men's health and like post prostatectomy, things like that, it's not really an area that I love treating. Yeah. Um, so I typically refer to my colleagues for that. It has yeah. to be a, you know, a topic that you feel comfortable treating as well. And again, that yeah. just reverts back to the safe space for the practitioner as well. Yeah. But how, yeah, like, and I think that that's a conversation that is a very important conversation as well in men. Like, this isn't just a women's health issue. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I 100% agree. Yeah. Um, I do have two therapists for more or less male issues I will refer out to because they're very well-versed, they're very well-skilled in those areas, and mm -hmm. that's kind of what they enjoy treating. So um, I use my network in yeah. that way. And yeah. that's just it. That's like, you know, if, if you're not comfortable treating it, you refer out, and that's just the best yeah. thing you can do for the client. And the client will love you for it. Like, yeah. when you refer out the client, and you refer to a good referral, the clients love you even more, and they'll... Like, I get referrals from people who I've referred out because they're like thank you like that means yeah. more to me than you just fumbling your way through something that you're not comfortable doing yeah or you know i've seen you for this length of time and and you're doing the same treatment and there's no change mm -hmm. you know recognizing you have your own limitations as a practitioner is so important because like i say to my clients all the time if you don't notice a change in three or four visits with me i either need to do a reassessment or we need to have somebody else look at you yeah. because i don't want to waste your money i don't want to get into this cycle that we just do the same thing with no change, like then I'm not doing my job. Yeah. So I want to make sure that you get the care that you need because your health is a good referral for yeah. me. That's the definition of client-based care, in my opinion, is doing what's best for the client, which is, yeah. you know, sometimes forgotten in our industry. <laughs> yeah. 100%. We won't go there though. <laughs> 
Do you think that every single person going through pregnancy should be doing physio during previously or after? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I am a firm believer. I, I know that not all, all pelvic floor physios think this way. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to see you in pregnancy because mm-hmm. it's more than just the pelvic floor that's impacted. Mm-hmm. As your body is going through the hormonal changes and the structural changes in pregnancy, it deconditions you. Yeah. You're after a certain number of weeks, you're not allowed to do core exercises and your aerobic activity decreases and things like that. So it changes the way that your muscles fire and function. Mm-hmm. Um, so it takes time to build that up after. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's a really hard struggle for a lot of women. They think that, oh, you know, it's six weeks postpartum. I can go back to doing what I'm doing. And I'm like, well, no, it took 10 months for your body to get this way. Your muscles are biologically built that it's going to take some time yeah. to get that back. And you can't go back to doing what you were doing before. It would be like just stopping an exercise routine and then, you know, six months later doing the exact same thing. Like, I'd die. Yeah. So you have to slow. muscles decondition after like a week or two if exactly. they're not used. So. Yeah. yeah. So I just don't understand why in the medical community they think that once the pregnancy is over, it's totally okay to do yeah. that. Um, there's a ton of education when women are pregnant mm. that I feel would be really beneficial um, for especially first and second time mamas. So birthing positions for the pelvic floor, understanding the mechanics of the pelvic floor, like how do you contract it? How do you relax it? Mm -hmm. What happens to it during labor and delivery? Mm -hmm. Like most women are flabbergasted and their partners to know that the pelvic floor muscles stretch between 200 and 250%. Holy smokes. That's a lot. In delivery. So my question is always to other physios and and clients is, okay, you go out for a run and you pull your hamstring, what do you do? Oh, I go to physio. (laughs) Okay, cool. So your hamstring maybe stretched 30%, not 200 to 250. Oh my God. So learning about- great perspective. (laughs) Learning about those things, right? Learning about the changes and learning about birthing positions and the impacts of medication on the pelvic floor, Um, how, what the impact of an episiotomy is versus tearing forceps or a vacuum, a postpartum care plan. What do they do in the first six weeks before they can come see me? Belly binding, um, like abdominal wrapping, like all of these things are really good to learn. Postural education and awareness, Mm -hmm. um, general exercise guidelines. Yeah. So I think every woman who is pregnant and is going through that would benefit in one of those areas by having a conversation and getting screened, learning how to do a Kegel. Like that is a great thing to know Mm -hmm. because being pregnant, it's the only time in your life that you will ever have a built-in resistance on your pelvic floor. Use it, like (laughs) use it to your advantage. Because sometimes when we train the pelvic floor, we have to have clients buy vaginal weights. What do you think a baby is? (laughs) <laughs> there you go. So it's it's a really good opportunity to learn about your body because it does go through major changes in, in pregnancy. And postpartum too, a lot of things get missed. Um, postpartum after the first, a lot of women remain asymptomatic with an underlying condition right. that's really exacerbated with baby number two. Right. So what are some of those big conditions that you see typically? Prolapse is usually yeah. a big one. Um, grade two prolapses after a first baby are typically asymptomatic for the most part. Mm. Um, and it's that second time that they get pregnant and the um, increased blood volume and fluid and pressure is when they start to notice changes. Right. Um, diastasis gets exacerbated with a second if it doesn't heal properly the first time. So that abdominal separation, um, and a lot of women after the first baby don't have any issues, but they do have painful sex for quite a long time. So understanding the role of the hypertonic or tight pelvic floor muscles and, and scar tissue. Um, so things like that, I think are really beneficial for a lot of women first time. Education is yes. like simply the most valuable tool we can offer people, I believe. Yeah. Like, and you yeah. know, like the manual therapy, the exercise, all that stuff is incredibly powerful as well. But educating and empowering our clients with tools and knowledge yeah. is like the greatest gift we can really give them. And I think that that's like, that's huge. Yeah. Um, I want to pivot a little bit into like C sections. What do you see? I mean, I traditionally see a lot of low back pain with C sections. Yeah. 
And so, I mean, I assume that you see a lot of that as well. What are the, some of the bigger complications that you see like with a C-section? Um, so the impact of the scar tissue, um, there's C-section scar tissue. If there's uh, adhesions in the fascia or the connective tissue in the abdominal wall, um, the core is not going to heal properly. Mm -hmm. The muscles don't actually close because the tissue is impacting their ability to function. Low back pain pulling on the fascia, so mm -hmm. working on the scar tissue there. Um, and I think a lot of, uh, uh, I think a lot of the time, um, women who have C sections um, do things a little bit faster than what they probably should. Mm. They don't take the care. They're um, more quick to get back to their exercise and activities um, because they didn't have a vaginal delivery. And I right, think, they haven't had that pelvic floor trauma. Yeah. Yeah, um, and they're not, and I think there's just a lack of awareness and understanding that a C-section is a major abdominal surgery. Huge. And there's no education uh, provided, and you're basically just like, here, we just cut you open through seven layers of tissue, here's a newborn, can't lift anything for six weeks, good luck, bye. Yeah. And I think that there needs to be a lot more care and attention for C-section mamas um, and post-operative yeah. instructions. Yeah. yeah, in general, too. In like general, I, yeah. You know, like I... It blows my mind how many people come to physio after a major surgery and have been given no guidance and haven't even been told to go to physio. They just did it on their own will. They were like, oh, I think this is something I should go to physio for. And it also blows my mind how many people go and have surgery and then ask if they should see physio and people say no. And you're mm -hmm. like, what? Like, what makes you think that that's, you know, like, oh, you know, no, no, it's, it's fine, it'll heal. But like a C-section in particular, there's, yeah, don't lift anything for six weeks and like you'll be totally fine. Oh, don't that, drive too. That's helpful too in my oh, mom. Yeah. <laughs> but like that is a massive abdominal surgery. Huge. Like, yeah. People are having like scopic surgeries in the abdomen and having more advice given to them than people are having this like, what is it, like 10 centimeter incision sometimes? Yeah. Like Yeah. It's insane. I know. <laughs> I know. And what? I think I think I think the shift around C sections is okay, well, I think it's that whole women are, the belief that women are naturally meant to bear children and have children and, you know, it's a natural thing. Well, yeah, we do, we do have the ability to mm -hmm. grow a human being. However, there is still an impact to our body when that human being comes out of us and it doesn't matter if it's a vaginal delivery or a cesarean delivery, they have their own challenges. They are traumatic no matter what. It's a traumatic experience, and yes, the outcome is beautiful and magical for the most part. I mean, there are times where it's not, mm -hmm. um, but you know, when it's a healthy baby that's delivered, it's still a traumatic experience physically, emotionally. Like your life is flipped upside down. Yeah, and your body too. Like it's it's a completely traumatic experience, and I don't think that there's enough you know, awareness and credit given to the trauma that your body has experienced. And it's, you know, trauma during the delivery, but there's a lot, like, there's a lot of changes happening. There's sickness. There's a lot of emotional stuff happening during that process. Yeah. It's amazing. Like it absolutely just blows my mind how, you know, how much there is to learn. And, you know, I consider myself someone who likes to continue to learn and, and is somewhat intelligent, but I feel like I'm, and I don't have kids myself, so it's not something that I've personally experienced. So I don't, like I just it's a, an absolute black hole of information that I feel like we could be learning more about yeah and I think sometimes too people all like to have c-sections and I don't I no judgment on my end on how you choose to deliver your baby I think that they're just I think clients need to have an informed choice and they need to know the risks and benefits and sometimes mm -hmm. I talk to mamas after and they're like nobody told me that why didn't they share this with me like I had no idea that they could have cut my bladder or they did this or they could do this and a risk of infection and all these things aren't shared in advance mm -hmm. and I find that very scary actually yeah. that I'm a big proponent of consent 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 and informed consent and what does that mean an informed choice like I give my clients the risks and benefits of absolutely everything that I do because I want them to have all of that information so that they can make the best choice for them yes and in a lot of cases I find that pieces are missing and it kind of bugs me that I'm a physio and I'm the first to bring this up when they've yeah. seen two different OBGYNs and a bunch of nurses and their family doctor and all this stuff, these things that get, that get missed. So 
Yeah. 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 And I mean, I think it, it speaks maybe a little bit to our medical system and just how taxed it really is and how yeah. little time is given to these appointments because we're just, you know, the wait lists are so long and the client appointments are so many and yeah, yeah. things are, are being missed. And I mean, I think that people like yourself are doing the right thing and having these conversations, perhaps they're too late, but at least the buck stops somewhere. Yeah. And if they do have another one in the future, they at least know now mm -hmm. what like other questions to ask and and to get a better informed choice yeah yeah absolutely yeah there is and i mean this is just from my my somewhat limited knowledge but to my understanding if you can have a vaginal delivery that is uh an optimal choice for the baby in terms of like you know having that like bacterial swab for the baby and having that like first exposure to the microbiome and you know so if it is an option it's you know, it's a healthy option. And that being said, choice is obviously very empowering. Yeah. Um, and, you know, having that option is, I've heard, a healthy option for babies. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> um, I think generally women heal faster from a vaginal mm. delivery as opposed to a cesarean delivery. And if it is a healthy pregnancy and um, a healthy delivery, um, it is better for mom and babe um, yeah. to have a vaginal delivery because yeah. there is the risk of complications with a C-section. Um, permanent catheterization, uh, bladder nicks, um, abdominal wall separation, things like that. So <laughs> it definitely is, I, women do, and if they take the care and attention that they need post-recovery, they can bounce back pretty quick. I think it's more or less how women choose to um, heal in their postpartum, and, and, and postpartum is forever, but in that initial postpartum period, right. um, if, if we, tend to rush things and want to get things done quickly and not give ourselves the space and the permission to rest. Yeah. Um, we put ourselves through a lot of unnecessary stress. Yeah. yeah. That's a really good word, permission to rest, because I mean, a lot of us are, you know, like busy moms and busy entrepreneurs and busy people. And like, we don't give ourselves the space to rest because we're like, we're, you know, we're, we're super people and we can get things done. And allowing that rest and is not only important but it's necessary because it's going to yeah. feed to bigger problems down the road if we don't allow that healing and rest to happen yeah the more you can rest initially the better wow amazing yeah. and what are some i mean like given it's a you know a natural delivery and everything's healthy and good what are some things that you you often suggest to your clients in that like initial six week stage for like what's kind of a typical protocol um so in terms of postpartum care, our approach is rest, breathe, <laughs> get to know your baby, and ask for help is kind of the biggest things that we like to um, advocate for. Mm -hmm. So typically postpartum, um, like we need to reset the pelvic floor and we need to reset the core because it has been through a major experience and a major structural change. Yeah. Um, regardless if it's a cesarean delivery or a vaginal delivery, um, your pelvic floor is different after birth. And so um, we want the neurological and the connective tissue to go back to quote unquote normal as fast as possible. So by encouraging clients to do lots of deep diaphragmatic breathing mm -hmm. resets the relationship between the diaphragm and the yeah. pelvic floor. That piston. That mm -hmm. piston gets yeah. that work in. Um, <laughs> we encourage a lot of rest. So that helps with increased circulation to the abdomen. Um, it takes the pressure off your pelvic floor to just let things settle mm -hmm. down and heal. Um, and also too, like there's a lot of discharge after birth and it can last sometimes up to eight weeks. Um, so the more you can rest at the beginning, the faster your body heals and the sooner that goes away. Um, giving birth is expends more calories than running a marathon. Wow. So for women to understand that and to give yourself that space and not just be like, Oh, I need to go to the grocery store day two. No, find somebody else to go to the grocery store day two. You just ran a marathon. Yeah, like, like a marathon and a half. <laughs> yeah, like just sit down and like ask for a glass of water. Ask for somebody to bring you food. Don't host a party because a lot of people are like, oh, the baby's here and now everybody wants to come over to our house. Yeah, no. let's have that sip and see. And, yeah, yeah, go. Yeah. You know, like you, if somebody wants to come over, say, great. I appreciate the visit. I'm setting boundaries on the time that you're coming. Can you setting, also bring some groceries? <laughs> bring some groceries or what are you bringing me to eat for dinner? Yeah. Um, should be your response as opposed to, sure, no problem. I'll help come over. I'll make some tea and like cookies. No, it's not happening that way. Yeah. Um, we encourage walking a couple of weeks after birth just to get the blood flow going and yeah. get your body um, a little bit of aerobic conditioning. 
And then we incorporate pelvic floor contractions and pelvic floor activation around that time too. Mm -hmm. And then um, by six weeks, we're increasing their aerobics with incline walking and more targeted pelvic floor and core exercises. And then at 68 weeks is we encourage them to come back um, for a pelvic floor check postpartum. Right. So you have that initial conversation postpartum with them or ideally previously yeah whenever and you can. have that you know that conversation so they're prepared they know what to do and then you check in with them in that six to eight week range yeah yeah the biggest thing is is they need to be discharged by their primary primary health care provider so right. their midwife or their ob or their family doctor right just to get that quote-unquote medical clearance yeah um, for us to be able to <laughs> intervene yeah. yeah fair enough um i mean it's so like and that's in a, a healthy normal quote-unquote yeah pregnancy, but I can imagine the complications that can come otherwise are really, really challenging and really, you know, different and unique to every single case. And so that's where having someone who is trained like yourself to help them and guide them through that is so, so, so important Yeah, and very underrated in my opinion. I think, I think you're absolutely right. Every single person should have this education and knowledge and, you know, network of people that they can come see. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about um, just in your own role as a clinic owner, um, obviously like clinic owner, mother, you know, all these titles that you have, what are some of your own like self-care non-negotiables that you, <laughs> we've got the cat on the couch with us here and she was enjoying a nice little pet and then got a little aggressive and, and jumped down. <laughs> what are some of your uh, self-care non-negotiables in terms of like entrepreneurship, momship, wifeship? all the ships that you're on? <laughs> um, that's a really difficult question for me to answer <laughs> and something that I am really struggling with um, personally because I have an innate ability to put everybody else before mm. myself. Yeah. So in terms of self-care non-negotiables, I try and go to bed at the same time every day. Yeah. I'm getting a lot more ruthless with that because I need my sleep. Um, food, I'm, I, at least I can control my food, so yeah. I'm very careful about um, what we're eating, making sure that there's usually healthy food um, at mm -hmm. home, in the kids' lunches, and for myself. Yeah. Um, I go for massages every three weeks um, to maintain my body, mm -hmm. um, because otherwise I have a tendency to have numb hands from working with them mm -hmm. all the time. Yeah. So it it's kind of a self-care thing, but totally. it definitely keeps me going and I know when I miss a massage I feel it um the sensation then is kind of important when you're using them to assess yeah pretty much um so those are kind of my big ones um a lot of my self-care like I actually enjoy watching my kids yeah. activities and sports and the social aspect that comes with that so it's huge yeah I like it so I do have a tendency to prioritize them um because yeah that it is it's actually really important it's for bonding it's it. connection it's social yeah. it's you know like that is yeah. part of why we become mothers and fathers is to experience those joys of yeah you know like living living these experiences with your children yeah in the summer we do a lot more stuff as family time mm -hmm. we do a little bit more traveling um which is like self-care for me me too um i need to get away once in a while just to create some space yeah. for me to think yeah. Um, and then I've recently, last few weeks, really started working out. And even if it's just 20 minutes, I've been taking it and working out in my home gym. I've realized that trying to get to classes and stuff just doesn't work with my schedule. Yeah. Um, so having the flexibility to just go downstairs into my studio space has been really good. Amazing. The studio space that was the clinic, I'm yeah. assuming. <laughs> yeah, it's good. There's a bonus. <laughs> what are some of your biggest um, like wins and um, like wins and successes been as an entrepreneur? Like what have been some of the biggest like fruitful things that have come from that, do you think? Of being an entrepreneur yeah. or clinically? Um, a clinical entrepreneur. <laughs> I would say entrepreneur, more so like a clinic owner. Yeah, like what have been some of the biggest like wins that you've you've had or like what some of the um, biggest learning opportunities that you've had, I guess, would be a better way to frame that. That's a really good question, Danny. <laughs> um, I think one of the biggest learning um, learning objectives or learning opportunities that I've had, I guess, in the last six months of being a clinic owner right. and, and actually having employees in my clinic um, is learning to prioritize them and learning to prioritize their needs mm -hmm. and learning 
how to support them because creating a positive clinic culture and creating space for each one of them individually yeah. has been huge for us as a team um, as well as for them. Yeah. Um, so honestly, like prioritizing my staff over what I need. So always creating time for them, always answering their questions, always answering their emails, checking in with them, um, and showing them my appreciation for their a job well done. Like I really want my the therapists who work with me um, to know that I love them and I appreciate them and I really enjoy working with them. Yeah, yeah. that's huge. And as a as a, a clinician myself, like that feeling of support and that feeling of connectivity and that feeling of appreciation is something that I, when it's received in my practice and in my clinical environment, I feel so grateful for it. So on the other end of that, I appreciate that as, you know, and, and there's something really to be said about someone who is a clinic owner and clinician themselves because they have both ends of this of the spectrum and they experience both aspects of it. And so I think that's, that's really cool. It's an amazing learning opportunity really is to, to yeah. see that. And, learn how to support the others that are working with you yeah that is it's it's honestly for someone who's never taken a business course never done any like entrepreneurial (laughs) anything I I just wing it like I'm winging it right now and I'm I'm trying my best um and I think you know when things come up and you're like I probably didn't handle that the best you know taking the time to reflect on that yeah so that you know how to approach it differently in the future yeah and it doesn't become a habit or a, a ritual or a you know yeah something that happens regularly. or you just don't like brush it under the table or like under the rug and it's like oh that didn't happen yeah it did yeah. and acknowledging that it did and and going okay well it happened what are the circumstances around why it happened how do I reframe this? How do we move forward? And, and, and what can we do to make it better next time if it does happen again? Self-awareness. Every yeah. single, I think every single conversation I've had on this podcast has literally come back to self-awareness and acknowledgement of, you know, owning your stuff. Yeah. That is a own your huge, shit. huge theme. Right? Own your shit. Own your, own shit. your shit. Yeah. Because, yeah, I, I don't think like two years ago, there's no way that I would have been in the right headspace to do what I'm doing now mm. because I hadn't done that process yet and I hadn't done that work and I hadn't done that personal yeah, personal stuff before. And maybe that's why everything happened the way it, it happened. Like it had to, you know, like that time had to happen. You had to have your own space here before the commercial space was available in order for you to have that growth and that time, you know, like everything in divine timing is, you know, like yeah. X marks the spot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. I like, I just love your story. I think it's, I could just go on for days and days, but I want to be respectful of your time. So before I last, I ask the last question for you. Where can people find you online and how can people book in at Bump Physio & Co. if they're in town? Um, so if you're local to the Tri-Cities area, um, we service Maple Ridge, Mission, Abbotsford, Langley, um, <laughs> Burnaby, Coquitlam, Fort Coquitlam, Fort Moody, um, Vancouver <laughs> even. I get clients from Vancouver and North Van coming to see me, wow. which is pretty incredible. Um, our website is www.bumpphysioco.ca. Um, you can find us on Instagram at Bump Physio. You can find myself on Instagram at Lacey Forsyth PT, where I do a ton of public health education and share my life as a mompreneur. Um, and then on Facebook too, you can find us at Bump Physio. So Amazing. that's where you can find I us. I love your Instagram. They're so good. They're so good. And they're so vulnerable. <laughs> they're like, like your posts are just hilarious. I love it. So like anyone listening, do follow Lacey because she's awesome on Instagram. Thank you. <laughs> and her dog, Holly, is always on Instagram as well. And Holly's been hanging out with us today and I, she's always on Instagram and she's cute. So Thank follow you. her. So my last question that I ask everyone on the podcast is, what is your definition of balance? Um, well, in theory, my perfect (laughs) definition of balance was, is everything kind of coexisting in harmony where everything's in a bit of a steady state. Um, my definition of balance right now is like controlled, organized chaos, um, (laughs) where I can manage my schedule effectively and function. I just think like, I, I don't have balance in my life right now, but I'm okay with that because I, for me, love the diversity of my day Mm. and I love the opportunity to control the ebb and flow. So for me, when I'm starting to feel overwhelmed and very unbalanced is when I say to my husband, we need to go away for the weekend. We need to go to Kelowna. I go see my family and my Mm -hmm. friends. We go to the cabin um, or we look at planning a bit of a vacation 
just to get away. Mm -hmm. And so I'm starting to block um, block schedule me a little bit. So every few months I take a week off clinically to catch up on some of the things that I've been neglecting or needing to do either around the house or within the business or just take that time to reflect. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so balance for me is a little bit of a, a, a tricky thing because I know at some point, like, when my boys are older, I'm going to have so much more free time. Yeah. So right now it's okay that I live a little bit of an I love that, life. though. Like, it kind of, to me, is like, it's perfectly imbalanced. And that yeah, is it works. balance. Like, you know, balance is just, yeah. you know, finding joy in what you're doing and, and having that control over it. Yeah, I think that's a good way to look at it because, you know, I saw that question <laughs> in advance and I was like, I don't have balance. I don't really know what that is. But like, if I was to conceptualize what balance or what I think balance looks like, I feel like I would be, you know, never stressed, nice and relaxed, always enjoying the things that I wanted to do. I'd always have enough time to get everything done within that time frame that I've set aside for it. Instead of like the micromanaging and the controlled scheduling that I do. Mm -hmm. But for me, we managed to still get everything done. So maybe that is balanced. Yeah. I don't know. It's working. It's working. Whatever it is, it's working. It's working. And <laughs> your clinic is so successful and beautiful and warm and safe and all the awesome things. And I think what you're doing is absolutely working. And, you know, as long as you are feeling aligned and joy in doing so, then hey, like, <laughs> whatever works. <laughs> I love it. Lacey, thank you so much. I can't wait to share this. I think there are like a ton of people who are going to find a ton of value in all this. So thank you. I really appreciate your time and thanks again. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you found this episode as expansive as I did. If you enjoyed listening, please like subscribe and review. It means so much to us. If you would like to learn more about the balanced collective and our offerings, please visit www.thebalancedcollective.com or hit us up on Instagram at the balanced collective. Thank you so much. And please keep spreading your light.